Thanks, Sam, and uh, thanks so much for coming out, taking your lunch break here. Um, this presentation is basically an explanation of kind of how I got to where I am and the path that I took as an artist to get to this point. Um, I began making photographs kind of in the tradition of uh, a lot of the great landscape photographers like Joel Sternfeld and Stephen Shore and um, to some extent William Eggleston as well. And the, the first few pictures I'll show you <coughs> just to give you a sense of kind of the, the change that I made in graduate school. And the project that I applied to graduate school with is called Encounter. And it was basically a book project in that tradition, um, driving around America for basically over the course of three years, I, I made three big loops around the country. And the project uh, was about basically a search for people, places, and things that inspire uh, kind of a sense of wonder. And in this process, I, I learned to appreciate the kind of exploration and discovery process uh, of this kind of t of this kind of photography, and which I would later kind of incorporate to into kind of building things and instead of physically exploring space, um, kind of exploring things via experimentation. Um, this project gave me the kind of formal skills that I later used uh, in my other work. And this picture called Irving Pointing to God kind of summed up the way I thought about um, picture making at the time, where like this guy Irving who I came across and suggested that I make a picture of him pointing to God, he kind of communicates what's most important to him in this really simple and direct gesture. Uh, in the same way, I was trying to make photographs that uh, I could basically do the same thing, just point at a subject matter that I thought was uh, interesting and hope that that by itself could carry the interest of the viewer. But grad school and I guess I would say undergraduate program as well is not about um, finishing a body of work uh, and, perf well, maybe undergrad is, but graduate school, you're not really supposed to come in with a body of work and just take those three summers or two years to kind of perfect it, and immediately I was kind of uh, critiqued for kind of having the answers all summed up in the sense that I had developed the style, I had developed the subject matter, and I just had to keep executing those pictures. So <coughs> the second summer, or the, my first off term, Bard works like a kind of art summer camp. You have three consecutive summers of two months of intense critiques, followed by a ten month, two ten month kind of interim periods. So my first interim period, when I was preparing to go around the country again, I um, wanted to do something different than what I'd just been doing and, and develop another project at the same time. And the words of uh, one of the one critique I had, which were to kind of intervene in my own, own image making process, kind of came back to me. And I, I took that kind of literally to mean get in the way of the camera and just start something new. So immediately beginning this project of kind of participating with the landscape, I, I realized that I'd, I'd kind of stumbled into a new kind of language for me, one that uh, liberated me from a lot of the, the I guess, the rules that I'd assumed in making these pictures of kind of the American landscape and portraits and subjects of things uh, like Sternfeld and company. By, by using my body as uh, a kind of a material, as a performer, as an object, I felt a kind of a great freedom to, to kind of really play in the, in the landscape. The other thing that I was able to do in this project is, is bring humor into my work, which I hadn't done, or I hadn't, something about the encounter project was, was too serious to allow that. So, you know, this was a kind of a way to start making art that reflected me in a way more that I, you know, I tell jokes now and then, and so it was nice to be able to allow a project that actually can be funny. Um, but working on this project has taught me a, a, a way of making art in, in a sense that I try and have two projects going simultaneously now the same way that I did on this project where one which is a work project where I have, uh, I understand the parameters that I'm working with like you know the landscape photography in that tradition and then I have this new one that I don't have any parameters and I kind of make up as I go along and that work and play often help inform one another. In this picture, for example, you know, I'd, I'd spent quite a long time just composing it to create this kind of illusion of 
space and you know by the time I was ready to take the picture I remembered where else I had seen this and there's this amazing Stephen Shore photograph of a billboard of a land of a mountain in this like plains area and it kind of was like oh right okay this is a little too indebted uh, I felt to him you know certainly without me in it so but but kind of following through with this kind of Mean America project I could still use the picture and feel like it was still my own um, when I engaged with the landscape so I don't know, it, it offered a way to kind of salvage some images which might otherwise, I might feel the need to edit out. Uh, by the end of the trip, this you know, six week trip, I had this kind of new body of work and a new kind of way of thinking that uh, really involved play and experimentation. And it gave me confidence to kind of try new uh, projects. So when I got home, I, I did an animation called Yard, which was basically a ex direct extension of this, um, of this project. I made this with the help of my dad and around my house in uh, my parents' house in Virginia. But you know, at the time coming back from this prod from this road trip, I couldn't help but think of this uh, idea of this kind of face down figure kind of dragging himself through the landscape as somewhat a representation for the way that I'd been making work before this Me in America project, in that I I didn't feel like I was necessarily thinking hard enough about the tradition of American photographers and how my work was was a significant departure from it. It is. <laughs> so this this animation led to a kind of series of animations dealing with this idea of an automaton, which is kind of a being with um, purpose but without consciousness and you know in it the body kind of functions as a machine the face is really never shown and it's just I don't know it's a kind of about the uncanny and um, also just about using my body as kind of an apparatus the best example of this um, idea of a, a automaton and mechanization is this piece called uh, animal and in it uh, I try and reproduce the animation that Edward Moybridge did of the of a first running horse that proved like a horse's feet leave the ground. But when I attempted to do this, it was like impossible to actually like my joints don't move like a horse's joints, so it wasn't possible to do that. So instead, I just developed these other kind of running motions that I could I could actually do by stopping and starting, which is actually really hard to kind of remember which direction your bodies are supposed to move in. Um, this, that second summer after, <coughs> after the second summer at Bard, and in thinking about Edward Moybridge and the history of uh, photography, I started thinking uh, um, about the history of flight as well, and mostly because of an essay I read by Edward Said called On Amateurs and Professionals, which um, I suggest you guys check out, because it's, it's just a great piece. It's aimed at kind of uh, the intellectual class which Saeed warns um, that professionalization of academics leads to specialization and basically limit, limits your ability to, to kind of think and follow ideas where they take you. you know, to me, it was the exact same thing of where my photo career had kind of gone. I had developed a very specific way of making pictures, and I was starting to get commercial work from it, and I felt like it was totally a kind of uh, description of how my you know, art had become kind of professionalized and limited. So in reaction to that, I decided to make this, and, and in thinking about the history of photography and the history of flight and how they were both pioneered by amateurs, um, free to kind of experiment without any of the constraints of professionalism, I made this nine foot paper airplane and started doing these night kind of tests. And, you know, again, I felt the same kind of uh, freedom that I felt when I started taking those Me in America pictures because this was like an, a new language, um, using these kind of white objects and figures and, and using the night as a background um, for this kind of science and the mystery that can happen at, at night. 
Um, this picture is kind of like, you know, I mean, uh, some of it relates to the idea of kind of like, you know, hidden mysterious scientific projects that, you know, Russians were supposed to be doing during the Cold War or, and kind of this idea of a backyard kind of spectacle of something happening, you know, somewhere out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> where a guy with his car and like a uprights and some bungee cords creates this thing that can kind of like levitate a, a person. In this case, it's actually just a life-size dummy of myself. But um, so the project called Sublunar consists of these four iconic shapes. You know, the human form, uh, the line, an orb, and the kind of rectangle and the triangle of um, of a paper airplane. And I felt like these really simple iconographic forms, in some way, relate to the um, the kind of base motivation in human beings to transcend themselves, whether through, I don't know, religion or technology or uh, mysticism or whatever. But it's it certainly almost felt like a hieroglyphic kind of symbol for something that, you know, takes us above ourselves. This picture, to me, is almost like a reverse moon landing, um, where instead of kind of jet packs taking these guys off of the surface of the moon. They're, they're using these leaf blowers, really low-tech technology, to kind of levitate uh, a balloon, which kind of becomes the moon in this case. This photograph was the last one I made at Bard. Um, you know, it's based on a blanket toss Native American kind of ritual. And I really like that idea of kind of this community of people kind of just like all together, like just pushing this person into the air. This last photograph in the series uh, I made just as a document of an apparatus used for this next video I'll show you. But <coughs> I, I ended up incorporating it in the photographic part of the series because uh, of just the formal, the formal qualities of the, f of the structure that I, I really, really liked and kind of couldn't see while we were putting it together as it was getting dark and we were just racing to get it into one piece. And when I finally photographed it, I was like, wow, I really love this this shape, um, this kind of sail-like thing off of my car. And um, so I don't know, the, 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 the video that I use this for is called Follow. And I did it in this dry lake bed in California called El Mirage. I had gone out there to make uh, a video of just this nine-foot plane kind of in constant state of loft um, as a kind of wish fulfillment for this, this amateur who's obsessed with weightlessness. You know, but after shooting a number of takes with just the plane, um, I realized that there's basically no scale and there's no sense that this was actually a nine-foot plane, not a nine-inch plane. Um, so the last take, I asked the assistants I was working with to just slowly accelerate the car until I couldn't keep up with them and I would just run behind this and in doing so it kind of turned into an endurance piece and it kind of be it's somewhat more funny because of the this the scale uh, difference but it's ultimately you know a kind of representation of this like constant striving for this thing that's like somewhat out of reach and it's and the kind of pathos of, of never being able to get there Sorry? Oh, it's um, I just bought one of those like one million candlelight white ugh, candlelight powered spotlights, and put a bracket on it, and then b attached the video camera to that. So, it's just a spotlight. Um, it's made of uh, that one was made of foam core. This video is called um, Joshua Tree Launch Series. And, uh, you know, it was kind of about using these kind of four things, like the monumental boulders in Joshua Tree, the, this kind of makeshift apparatus, the plane, and me, and having this kind of tension exist between the four of them 
represented in this kind of still moment before anything happens. Um, and it's just the same thing over and over again, these different ways of kind of using these, uh, these massive boulders as ballast to, to launch this thing. This is such a fun project to work on just because, you know, it, A, it's fun to work in the landscape, but just figuring out these different ways of kind of getting, accessing these like little crevices to like launch, to create these sets was, was just like, you know, and it ended up coming back into the, my later work, like the, the stuff that's in the Kendall show. Are you alone? No, I have, I have one assistant helping me. But by the end, like, I feel like we kind of developed somewhat elegant forms. Like, I really like this, that thing. And I'd have him kind of pull the apparatus out of the way so that the plane didn't go soaring into it. Just a hook. But this is the first one we would tried, which was trying to work like a hinge that would move out of the way. And You can see it didn't really work that well. Um, so, like that project, which in some way, like physically uses these kind of grand aspects of nature, this video called uh, Monument Valley Flight Attempt tries to access that same quality of the kind of the, the, the sublime quality of nature, but in two forms both the physical one that, you know, that's a hundred foot drop, which, you know, the potential energy from that place to launch the plane but also the kind of metaphysical power of nature where, you know, like Caspar David Friedrich's like massive, this German expressionist painter, um, 19th century, um, made these like massive landscapes with just this like little figure there. You know, like that, the, the, this is set so that the figure can kind of hope that the landscape gives back that power in a way and allows him his like little plan here to work. Um, so. Uh, this is in uh, Monument Valley in Utah. And I, you know, I walk out there in the video, but I'm just, for the purpose of this, it's just cut to the... So in the end, again, it's this kind of massive failure. Um, but there's a real kind of, I think, heroic sense to attempting something like this and, um, and a kind of funny quality to it failing. So in some ways, it's like, uh, like Wiley e. Coyote, who also works in the landscape, you know, considers himself a super genius and works on all these in intricate plans, which inevitably backfire. Yeah, that's a that was a real stroke of luck because yeah. it's funny to for like nature to kind of zip in and be like <laughs> you suck and then leave, you know. Um, the last video in this project, uh, the sublunar project, is is called Fall, and it was kind of a uh, another like wish fulfillment for this character, um, but in a somewhat dark form where you know and he gets his wish of kind of weightlessness, but it's only via uh, this kind of relative thing where, you know, the difference between flying and falling is, is the ground. Um, so that, you know, he's kind of perpetually in this state of loss, but there's a sense that, you know, eventually he just might come crashing down and die, or he might be just like thrown out of a space capsule somewhere and, and just lost in space where, again, you can't tell the speed that you're moving because there's no gravity. So I think that this video kind of plays with that relative relativity in a way and um, you know our successes and our failures are always measured against something um, that's uh, whoops um, let me just say what it's a person and I'll say a few more things about the project I, I shot it in Asheville North Carolina where 
there's uh, an open uh, vertical wind tunnel that's not inside so that you know we can use the night sky to be the black background um, and I hired the, one of the guys who worked there who's you know an expert skydiver and um, you know whatever he could he could do this I tried a couple of times and it was just like this isn't gonna work if I do it because it's actually really hard to maintain a kind of out of control look but also stay inside the you know the 15 foot so he's being blown up, like he's being blown up except that it's like a million dollar apparatus that sends like a 110 mile an hour wind tunnel just like straight up you know um, so the last this next video uh, is called William Tell and it's the last video I made at Bard and it kind of um, it began a new set of projects uh, since graduating from uh, my MFA program and you know the story of William Tell is um, this kind of myth or I guess it's not a myth maybe I don't know if it's actually w to what how true truthful the story is but it's about you know um, the story of a guy who can perform a kind of perfect act that saves himself and his son and um, this character, much like the character in the Sublunar series, is kind of obsessed with that quick, quick, quixotic um, uh, quest for glory, but without any of the real consequences that existed in the William Tell story. So, you know, basically re retelling the story as a self-contained thing, where instead of there being a shooter and a person who's getting it, this thing shot off his head, there's just one person. So you'll see how how it works. So there's obviously a, a slapstick quality to this, um, the ridiculousness of this thing that's used to protect him is kind of too much for a single BB. It's well, you'll see more how it's how it's done. It is. The funny thing about this was that it was like maybe a week before my MFA thesis show, so the project itself was kind of this like semi-idiotic last-minute thing where I went out the night before with like a, a scythe I bought from Home Depot to clear it because I can't walk through the tall <laughs> grass, so I was like, Ugh, just like cutting down and cutting this like path to make the set for the thing. It was, I kind of wish I'd documented the whole process because it's a lot like what the piece is about. It's uh, just a granite tile. It's kind of amazing that the, you can actually see the BBs. Like, uh, I still don't quite understand how that's, that's possible. No.
and such is this like small triumph for this person in the middle of nowhere. But um, that uh, this piece is called Vital Capacity, um, and it was basically an attempt to make a uh, a work that's about a kind of Sisyphean struggle where there's a delicate balance between two forces, one being gravity's exertion on these balloons <laughs> and the other being just my ability to, to exhale and breathe, you know. It's called vital capacity, which means the largest breath you can exhale. No, it wasn't because the pops were actually really loud and I f forgot to wear earplugs on this take and um, so it was ac they're actually pretty somewhat traumatizing when you're doing it. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, but I had a friend kind of with all these different balloons outside of the set, you know, some were almost all air, some were a mix, um, so they fell slowly, and then some were really mostly helium like this one, so that they were really easy to kind of maintain, and, and he kind of, you know, just started kind of playing with how the whole thing was happening. So, as you'll see, like, he starts just like releasing more and more, which was great, because I, I couldn't direct that at this point. Um, But I, I really, I mean, so much of my work ends up being about these two physical opposing forces. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, the piece goes on for another eight minutes, or another five minutes, so I'm not going to show you the whole thing. But um, I like, you know, showing this helmet um, that I made specifically for this project, too, because like the, the metal suit that I wear in the William Tell piece, they both kind of refer to kind of masculine tropes of like, you know, warriors, these things that we use to protect ourselves in battle, but in both cases they kind of reveal the vulner vulnerabilities of the, the character. And in this case, like, it's, it's like, it's actually transparent and the, the things used to kind of protect me are actually the things that end up causing the, the trauma. Um, well, this is a, this video is in the show downstairs. It's called Emerge and um, it, it was kind of, made in somewhat a reaction to vital capacity and that it's just the total opposite. Instead of uh, two forces working against each other to be, to reveal struggle, it's, um, it's just about effortlessness in a way. I've been um, thinking about how to make up different answers every time someone asks me, but my latest one has been like, well, we hired this under, this like small miniature sub with, you know, a hatch that opens, but uh, I don't know. I don't have, I wish I kind of liked lying more, but I, it like kind of hurts me. But so I actually made it with um, like pasta strainers, uh, like the dollar plastic hemispherical pasta strainers, and then build a, a kind of bracket that went around them and then attached cinder blocks and sandbags to that. And then just with a rubber band, um, the pasta strainer kind of goes from a down position to an up position when a pin is pulled out. So I had friends on either side of the set uh, of the camera frame kind of, you know, and I would point to them and, uh, and then they just pull the thing. And so it was, it was remarkable that it actually kind of worked as well as it did in this take because, you know, the two prior, prior, prior takes, um, the wind was a little bit stronger, so they all blew out of frame and, and then, like, the things just start falling apart in the salt water. And yeah. It's shot um, in Brooklyn, actually. It's off the Belt Parkway in Jamaica Bay, which is 
amazing, actually, because it does not look like the rest of Brooklyn. And there's actually land just across there, but because of the kind of fog of that day, you couldn't see it. Um, so the other piece that's downstairs that you probably may have seen um, is called Actions. And Actions was a way of kind of incorporating William Tell, Vital Capacity, and Emerge kind of in one piece. You know, so some of them involve me and are kind of about this kind of heroic act and or act, action hero kind of thing. And then some of them have nothing except the apparatus and it's kind of this deistic process that takes place without, like Emerge, without anything, without me having to do anything. I'm sorry? Um, I just like that material, you know. But again, it's, I think, the transparency of both the mask and the holsters um, somewhat makes fun of the action hero trope, even though I like the action hero trope. And most of them are just very, very simple um, kind of ideas, and then a executions are just <laughs> a matter of redoing it until it, it works the way I wanted it or some other way that might be more interesting. It's fun kind of recycling these materials like the mask from whatever vital capacity and the, the bungee from sublunar. You're just having these materials around ends up being like fosters kind of an, uh, the, the next project, the next idea. Um, I built a, uh, like a subfloor so that the actual, um, so that the floor is actually like five feet up off the ground in my studio and there's a rod that goes down through the floor through another point below it that keeps it from falling over and down so that it doesn't topple over. But again, I like, I mean, so much of the actions is really about kind of just using these, uh, these gravitational forces or other forces that just slowly kind of, you know, work their way out on a, on a physical object like cans or balloons. This is the last um, action in the series.
also in all of these um, in all of these videos, working with these materials that I'd started to kind of play with in graduate school, like doing the sublunar project, kind of came back and uh, you know, and I've it kind of taught me that you know I really enjoy actually working with these uh, in a really kind of formal way, making objects, even though I don't feel the need to kind of keep them like as sculptures in, in three dimensions permanently. Um, it's actually kind of nice to, to work in a way where you, you, you make the thing and then you take it apart and recycle it back into something else. But all of these pictures I made of the sets of the, the actions kind of, this, there's always this kind of, there's an equilibrium in play and the action essentially moves something from one, set, one state of equilibrium to another. And you know this this video I don't have on this slideshow, but it's in the series downstairs. Um, you know, many of these things just came like as one takes. This one was I was just kind of playing with materials, and then just did a video of it, and it never kind of re could never I could never reproduce the effect of these pieces of videotape kind of falling off this balloon off frame and down through the set. Um, so working with these materials ended up becoming a kind of dis uh, the same kind of exploration process that I'd. I felt like is kind of coming back to the kind of encounter project in a way, but just through exploring with materials, experiment, experimenting with materials instead of driving through space. Um, and like I mentioned before, having a work and play project, uh, I, while working on actions, I was kind of making these uh, sculptural interventions in the landscape. Um, and I began these about a year ago after I started, uh, I was pretty well underway in the actions project. But I was in Germany for a show, and I wanted to to, to start making work again, even though I was away from my studio and didn't really have any materials. So I started collecting quick ties while in Berlin, just like because they they're left up after construction sites leave. And I was thinking about a way to kind of use them somehow. And um, so this whole project of interventions just comes out of you know necessity of of being somewhere and still wanting to make something and, and using cheap materials or found materials. And again, like Encounter, I mean, I, I, a lot of it is done near my uh, studio in Brooklyn where I can just kind of bike around and look for things to use, uh, assemble, and then kind of take down. This one is not in Brooklyn, but. But you know, a lot of the same forces are at play, this kind of just binding and constricting and expanding things that, uh, that are happening in the studio as well. But I think having, uh, being able to work outside and work with color was a great complementary project while working on actions. You know, and this one um, I think gets at something that's not in a lot of the other ones that, that are more just physical arrangements of objects. This actually kind of points to another space that we can't see in the picture. And you know, I think about this, this intervention specifically because it it goes beyond just playing with found things and playing with binding and, and forces. How did you bring that to technology after the Um, you know, I started using um, a digital SLR in uh, after basically all through sublunar. And you know, so I've and with this project it was really important to to kind of not really not even use a tripod for as many of these as I could to just kind of like leave as much gear at home and just instead take balloons and string and quick ties and stuff that I could use to make it and a camera and then just shoot it at whatever is available light. Um, um, that kind of helped the, pro the project not be just about making beautiful pictures or making pictures that are like, you know, with as much depth of field as possible or whatever. Instead, it's just kind of about just doing the thing and making it and making the, picture, the thing to record this event. So I mean, this project's still in process, in in, in the works. I'll, I'll still add to this as I as I come up with ideas. But it it also feels to me like a project that needs to go further than like I don't know about. I'm I'm still not totally sure about all these pictures. Like maybe they only need to be done as studies, and they don't act. I don't know if I need to show them. Um, this video I made 
uh, this spring in Montana in a, outside of West Yellowstone. And it had been an idea that I'd, I'd tried to do before. Um, but it's called Duel. And it's, again, I kind of about these masculine tropes of competition, but using surrogates instead of, you know, our own bodies to kind of receive and exchange each other's, like, bullets or BBs. While out there, I, I made this other video um, called Tundra. I only released four balloons, and I just kind of, in After Effects, just sequenced it so that the loop wouldn't be quite as obvious, um, so that it could be this kind of really never-ending kind of migration of these of these beings. And I, it almost comes back to that idea of automaton, where it's like these things have some sort of purpose, but it's not clear that they have consciousness necessarily. Okay, so uh, I'll just. Quickly, I'll just show you one video that I made this summer. It's called Think Globally, Act Locally. <laughs> Involves exploding bananas. <laughs> um, pretty simple, they all explode. You can see it on my website or on YouTube. Um, and this video that I'm, you know, which I'm still in the process of shooting is called Hunt and Gather. And it's this project that I'm trying to finish in the next month. Um, but it's, uh, well, you'll see. So I cut down shoes that I see on power lines in Brooklyn, and then I trade the shoes that I cut down for the ones that I'm wearing and kind of continue this act and built this kind of bike that has a ladder on top of it to facilitate access to these shoes. Um, and the effect is kind of creating this invisible, um, or, or almost invisible because like, when you cut down a pair of shoes and you throw up another pair, it's it's very, it's like, would anyone notice? Probably not. Um, so it's essentially this set of invisible marks, uh, a constellation of kind of action and in and reaction to these actions. And I really wanted to make a piece that um, was like an intervention, except to intervene in someone else's intervention, to intervene in someone else's gesture, regardless of whatever they intended these shoes to mean. Um, I focus on not what the meaning of the hanging shoes are, which I can't access because I don't actually know. There's multiple meanings. Um, and instead focus on uh, the gesture um, as it being the last kind of act that they performed while they were still owners of these, of these shoes. Yeah, there's two uh, like four inch box cutter blades. Yeah, the police don't care so much about the device. Um, I don't know if they'd be so happy about the arrows. So <laughs> try and do this at like really early morning in really remote areas in, in, uh, in Brooklyn. So anyways, so um, that's it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>